Today we'll talk about attitudes and attitude change. First, a little bit about the nature of attitudes. Attitudes and their components. So an attitude would be considered any evaluation about people, objects, or ideas. In your book, you'll see this referred to as an attitude object, and by that they just mean people, objects, and ideas that we have evaluations about. Something to think about during the course of this lecture is non-evaluation possible. Or put another way, is there anything that you truly feel neutral about? Um, and I don't just mean in the sense of you click the middle button of a survey that you're completing to get some credit or some such, but if you really look at the things that you think about in daily life, is there anything you are 100% neutral about? A little bit about where they come from. So they are related to our temperaments, which are in turn related pretty directly to our genetics, as we inherit a lot of our temperaments from our parents. This does not, however, mean that they are specific genes that code for attitudes. Rather, there are some biases that genetics confer towards temperaments, and those temperaments in turn affect attitudes. Further, our environment and our learning context impact our attitudes quite significantly. This just has to do with the environment we grow up in, the things we learn in school and college, the things we talk to people we care about about. And all of these things ultimately also impact our attitudes. Generally speaking, attitudes have three parts or bases. The first is cognitively based attitudes. These are attitudes that are primarily based in our beliefs about the properties of an individual object or idea. Affectively based attitudes are attitudes based primarily in a person's own feelings and values, so not the particular aspects of an item or object, but rather how we feel about them. These generally stem from also three different things. Uh, people's values, so an example of this would be the death penalty is wrong. There's not really any specifics that you could point to, but rather it is generally a feeling of yes or no that people have, and this determines their attitudes in regard to the death penalty. There also arise from sensory reactions. This is something like the chocolate tastes great, thus I like it, or I form a positive attitude towards the chocolate, vice versa as possible, of course. You could eat some chocolate and decide you don't like it. Um, they also arise from conditioning. We'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. The third component is behaviorally based attitudes, and so these are attitudes based in people's observations of themselves. So these are probably less common than the other two, at least in our own awareness of our own attitudes. And these consist of, if we're not quite sure how we feel about something, we will introspect or recall our memories in which we either did or did not do something related to it. And based on how much or how little we do it, we will make a decision about whether we like that thing or not. So the example your book gives you is that if some person is asked whether they like going to the gym and they really have no opinions one way or another or haven't really thought about it until that moment, and it turns out they go to the gym five times a day, well, no, five times a week, let's say, because humans and time. If they retrospect or reflect on what they have been doing and they notice that, yes, this is a behavior they do a lot, and until then they've not really thought about it, they probably will conclude that they like that behavior or have a positive attitude towards it because they do it many, many times. Now, in order for us to derive or generate these types of attitudes, we must have our initial attitudes towards something be very weak or ambiguous, and there cannot be other plausible explanations available. So in this example of going to the gym, a plausible alternative example would be, I am going to run a marathon, and so I have been going to the gym regularly, even though I don't particularly care for the gym, I'm doing it for a very specific reason, and that's likely then not to change my attitudes towards the gym. One final note to keep in mind here is that while these are three different routes for attitudes, oftentimes it is a mixture or combination of these at play in any given circumstance. Next, we're going to talk about conditioning. 
So classical conditioning is the process by which a stimulus that evokes an emotional response is paired repeatedly with a neutral stimulus until such time that the neutral stimulus elicits an emotional response. So what this means is you have a natural response to certain types of things. For example, you tend to salivate before you eat some food and that response to this quote unquote emotional stimulus can be paired to other things. So for example, if every time I put down a plate of food in front of you, right before as you were smelling this delicious food about to be served to you, I also tickled your elbow. And I proceeded to do this over and over, day in and day out. And eventually what would happen is you would not even need the food to be present and simply tickling your elbow will elicit that same response as when you thought you were about to get food, in this case, salivating. Operant condition is slightly different. This refers to the process by which behaviors that are freely chosen are made more or less frequent through the use of reward, positive reinforcement, or punishment, which is negative reinforcement. Basically, this just means that you watch an individual or some organism act as they normally would. Ultimately, you could consider these relatively random behaviors. And then upon looking at those behaviors, you choose the behaviors you would like to have more or less. And then you provide either rewards to encourage certain behaviors to happen more often, or you administer punishments, in which case you're hoping that those behaviors become less likely. A uh, side note about punishment, um, strong, strong punishment doesn't really change attitudes or behaviors that significantly. Rather, it seems it just makes people more careful to do those behaviors in front of the person who is or administering severe punishment. Just something to keep in mind. Here's a figure that kind of shows some of the examples of what we just talked about. So if you look at the two sets in A, so here, let me just turn on this little pointer thing. So here in A, you see that what the book is talking about here is that you really enjoy going to your grandmother's house and your grandmother's house smells like mothballs. So you associate your grandmother's house with mothballs and you also associate visiting your grandmother with pleasurable feelings. And presumably you visit her fairly often and for a long time. And over time, what will happen is you will begin to associate those pleasurable feelings you have with your grandmother to the smell of mothballs. And while mothballs might be a funny example in this case, chances are, if you really reflected and thought about it, there are probably all kinds of random and odd things in your life that give you comfort or aversion for reasons that are probably tied to something like this. Here you can see operant condition, and I think the book gives a very poignant example in today's world. And this is one of the ways without really trying that much, many stereotypes and biases and prejudices can be passed on from generation to generation. So here, for example, or what the book gives as an example, is there is a young child who's playing at the playground and ends up playing with children of different races or ethnicities. Um, if you've never, as a child, been exposed to any of the dynamics involved, chances are you'll pretty equally play with all kinds of kids. Afterwards, the child goes back to the parent and the parent expresses disapproval about that child playing with children of some kind of different ethnicity or race or gender or whatever group you wanted to talk across. Over time, what will happen is the child will associate that negative or stern response to the child that they played with as opposed to directing it simply towards the parent. And what will happen is they will begin to associate those negative feelings with those other children of that specific ethnicity or group to which the parent originally expressed negative feelings or affect. Um, I suppose you could use this in a converse fashion where you give people rewards to do things, but ultimately the example here is just that even with how we express ourselves towards others who are learning or look up to us, our cues of positive or negative affect will oftentimes be enough to provide reward or punishment to other people. Now let's talk a little bit about explicit and implicit attitudes. 
So explicit attitudes are attitudes that we can consciously endorse and easily report. That just means that if I was to ask you about how you felt about, say, green tea, and you could tell me whether you liked it or not, and why, and many of the stories around it, for example, that would be something you could consciously reflect on, and what you would tell me would be your explicit attitudes towards green tea. So these are, like it says, the attitudes we think about when someone asks for our opinion about something. Implicit attitudes, on the other hand, are attitudes that are considered to be involuntary, uncontrollable, and unconscious evaluations. So if you were, for example, in that same green tea example, tell me that you quite like green tea, but every time I was to offer you green tea, you would kind of scrunch your nose a little bit and look around as if you could only find some other drink to have. And you did this in just an instantaneous moment before accepting the green tea and saying it was delicious. It could be that you have an implicit attitude that ultimately just reflects that you don't so much like green tea. Now, this also tends to have a stronger impact on our behaviors when we are not currently or monitoring our own behaviors. So for example, in that case, if you were very vigilant about not wanting to hurt my feelings over this green tea, you would probably be paying attention to your facial expressions or your interactions or behaviors. Thus, you would most likely be able to prevent those attitudes from manifesting. However, if you were really stressed because you had multiple deadlines looming and all kinds of random stuff happening in your family, chances are that you would not be paying much attention to schooling your reactions, and therefore those implicit attitudes are likely to have much more of an impact on your behavior. This is one of the reasons why prejudices tend to become more severe in times of stress and crises. Now, we can have these attitudes about pretty much anything, right? It doesn't have to be serious or life altering. It can be anything down to as simple as Coca-Cola versus Pepsi, just as it could be something monumentally life-threatening like the death penalty or abortion rights. Further, we often have different implicit and explicit attitudes towards the same thing. So this is the example I gave you of the green tea. Your explicit attitude was to like green tea. Let's say you're trying to enjoy it more. You've read about the health benefits, so on and so forth, and decided that you're going to like green tea now. That would be your explicit attitudes. Implicitly, maybe you grew up always sneezing at green tea or just never developed a taste for it, and so your implicit attitude still remains relatively negative in regard to that attitude. So this would just be a simple example of how your implicit and explicit attitudes can vary. This is something talked quite a bit about in prejudice literature, because very often you will have people who will explicitly endorse egalitarian norms and rules, while implicitly they will tend to not follow so closely in line with what they expressed explicitly. Now, this is just a tendency, though by no means rooted in all of these, but implicit attitudes tends to reflect our childhood learnings and societal biases around us, not necessarily what we will actually do. Whereas explicit attitudes tends to reflect our current learning and experience, and so long as we have the time to think about what we're going to do and are not under so much stress that we again can think about what we're going to do, these do tend to drive our behaviors. As soon as we get put into situations in which we are pressed for time or we're not able to think deeply about something, it is much more likely that implicit attitudes will guide our behaviors. That's a little sneak preview, I suppose, of when do attitudes predict our behaviors. So before we get into that, here's a story from the 1930s. So a European-American professor went on a sightseeing trip across the United States with two friends. These two friends turned out to be a Chinese couple. And so at that time, there was quite a strong degree of prejudice and discrimination towards Asian-Americans. And so, rightfully so, this professor was quite worried about racism, particularly towards his two friends. And so across this sightseeing trip, they stopped at 251 establishments. And out of all of those establishments, only a single one refused to give them service. Now, this professor was quite surprised by this. He, you know, he was very worried about the racism in the first place, and 
by the look of it, that even by today's standard is probably pretty good. Now, the weird thing happened when he, after going on this road trip, went and wrote letters to all of the establishments at which they had stopped, asking them if they would serve a Chinese visitor should they show up at their establishment. And now 90% of those places said they would not serve a Chinese visitor. And for weird symmetry, only one establishment said that they would in fact serve this Chinese visitor. The remainder of people were just undecided. Now, what's going on here? Obviously, there's a certain degree of sort of egalitarian behavior, let's say, from when they actually went on their road trip. So if you just looked at that, you would probably conclude that racism was on the down. But when you ask people about it, now that trend is almost completely reversed, where most people are expressing strong degrees of racism and discrimination. And what exactly is going on? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about what different cases, different types of attitudes come to bear. So in this example, when people walked into the restaurant, for example, it is possible that an automatic behavior of, oh, let us provide service, took over. And in that moment, people had already gone so far into their automatic behaviors of serving whoever had come into the bed and breakfast or camping ground and so forth, they just almost automatically did so and probably only in retrospect realized that they had served a Chinese couple. Whereas when they were written a letter, they had a great amount of time to deliberate and actually think about what their attitudes and opinions were. And this could be one of the reasons so many of them in turn said no. Now, while there were a bunch of problems with this original experiment, which were actually noted by the researcher himself, it has been replicated since then several times in different forms, and unfortunately, similar results do tend to be found. I mean, fortunate on one side, unfortunate on the other, I suppose. So when it comes to predicting spontaneous behaviors, so this would be the behavior you just automatically follow, a lot of it depends on how accessible our attitudes are. And when we're talking about how accessible they are, what we mean is just the strength of the association we have between some object or person or event in the world and our evaluation of that object or person. I suppose it could be a thought as well. A lot of times when we try and measure this, we measure this with reaction times and we assume that the faster you can report about your attitude when given a particular cue, that the stronger the accessibility or the strength of that association between whatever the cue was and your attitude. It turns out that the stronger this accessibility is, again, like I said, measured in ultimately reaction times, the more likely an attitude is to predict a spontaneous behavior. Now, just think for a second of what's going on. And what we're saying ultimately is the more tightly these two different things are connected in our brains, the more likely we are to do those things in a spontaneous behavior. Or another way of saying that would be in an emergency. So if you were used to doing something particular in an emergency, like let's say an ER doctor, the chances are if an emergency happens, you are going to default to that training that you have gotten. So that brings us to this next point of the more direct experience you have with some type of object that gives rise to those attitudes, the more accessible that attitude will be. Now, this, just like I was talking about with the ER surgeon, is actually why they get hours upon hours of training. Or in many situations involving people to deal with high stress situations, they tend to get similar types of training. The idea here is that you train them so much that when they have certain stimuli presented to them for the ER surgeon, that would be someone in trauma, for example, they automatically go about a certain set of behaviors because you don't want them to waste time thinking about what is the right thing to do next. Being able to automatically perform the correct behaviors in many of these crisis situations can save lives. So when it comes to deliberative behaviors, these are behaviors you think about before you act on them. Another way of saying this would be premeditated if you like to read mystery novels. So a lot of how we predict 
deliberate behaviors is talked about by this idea or theory of planned behavior. And it posits that when people have time to contemplate how they are going to behave, the best predictor of their behavior is their intentions. And intentions are generally formed through a combination of the following three things. They're formed by the specific attitudes. So the more specific an attitude towards a certain behavior, the better that attitude will predict that behavior. So now this not only applies to how specific our own attitudes are towards a certain behavior, but we as researchers who want to know, the more specifically we ask about attitudes, that applies as well. And an example of this is people were given a set of questions about their attitudes towards birth control, and they were asked of many, but here are two examples of the questions. So asked to rate their attitude toward birth control, and another question was their attitudes towards using the birth control pill during the next two years. Two years later, they were actually asked about whether they had used any of the birth control pills over the previous two years. And now the first question they had asked about just general attitudes towards birth control had a very low correlation with their actual behavior, uh, 0.08 in this case, which is pretty marginal. On the other hand, asking them about their attitudes towards birth control pills specifically during the next two years had a fairly high correlation with their actual behavior, 0.57, which in social science is pretty amazing. The second part that intentions are often formed by are subjective norms. And these are just people's beliefs about how others they ultimately care about in some way will view the behavior that they might perform. Now, you have to care about them in some way, right? It doesn't have to mean you like them, just that you care about their opinion in some form, because if you didn't care about them, who cares what they believe? And so an example of this would be, you know, you might hate the opera, but your friend loves it and would really like you to go with them, in which case you might go with them. And the subjective norm there, knowing that your friend's feelings will be hurt if you do not go with them because they would really like you to go with them, which maybe they've not actually said, but you kind of know it about them, right? So you've now just put that on them in a way, even though it might be true, that will ultimately change your behavior. But remember how we're talking about deliberative behaviors? You would have to have time to be able to think about your friend's opinions about you going or not going in order for that to influence your behavior. The third part that influences our intentions is this idea of perceived behavioral control. And this just refers to how easy or difficult we believe it will be to perform a certain type of behavior. So an example of this just if we were trying to predict how likely all things otherwise being equal it is for you to go home and buy some milk on the way home or to stop at a bench and read a couple chapters out of a calculus book it is likely that it will be more often the case that you will go and buy the milk instead of reading those chapters of calculus the reason for this, because as we said, all of the things being equal, it is just easier to get some milk, or I suppose this example is actually fries, on the way home, as opposed to on the way home, finding an ice bench and reading a bunch of chapters about calculus. And while for some people that might be opposite, for exactly the same reason, to them it is easier to read a couple books of calculus than to ultimately sit in a social situation while they have to get some fries, that might be reversed. But ultimately the concept remains the same of the easier it is that we believe it will be to engage in a certain behavior, the more likely we are to take part in said behavior. Okay, let's talk a little bit about how attitudes change. One of the ways in which attitudes can be changed is through cognitive dissonance. Now, before we jump into that, we will be talking about persuasive communication over the next several slides, and that just means any message advocating a particular side of said message or idea. Whenever you are espousing your opinion, wanting somebody else to be changed, whether you're trying to convince someone for their own good or just because you want to, all of those would be examples of persuasive communication. Now, cognitive dissonance, as we talked about previously, refers to the discomfort or dissonance that arises when we have discordant, which is just mutually conflicting, thoughts or attitudes. 
it is, please remember, particularly high when one of those thoughts are about ourselves. There is the phenomenon of counter-attitudinal advocacy, and this requires an individual to give a speech, or write a paper for that matter, supporting an attitude counter to their own. It helps if they are told that this speech or paper will be shown to the public. Now, ensuring that the individual finds an internal justification for giving this speech or paper is often fairly difficult and tends to be conducted by just randomly approaching someone and asking them if they would spend two minutes talking about the benefits or cons of something. Now, even though it is quite difficult to implement, it is extremely effective for individuals and ultimately can result in fairly long-lasting change of attitudes. That being said, it is not very good at changing attitudes across a large scale of people, which hopefully makes sense because if you have to go to everybody and have them write a speech or paper about something that is opposite of what they believe in and you had to do that for hundreds of millions of people, well, it would take it a long time and probably lots of money and most people don't want to spend either of those two things. So, looking at how messages to broad sets of people can be received or implemented and ultimately result in attitude change, one of the first set of studies, I suppose, that looked at how this applies and how the speaker and the listener and the message itself are all related has come to be known the Yale Attitude Change Approach, and it's just called that because the scientists who came up with this were at Yale at the time. It posits several factors as to what is important when a message will be effective at changing attitudes. So first of all, the who. So this is the source of the communication, the one who is speaking. Now, the more credible a speaker is, the more likely they are to persuade other people. This is true for attractive speakers as well, and the more attractive they are, the more likely they are to ultimately persuade people. Now, I'm not sure if that's a nice straight line where as you increase in attractiveness, your persuasion power increases as well, or if they're simply just two groups that switch over at some attractiveness point, who knows? Same thing for the credible speakers. Finally, there is something called the sleeper effect, and this is that people tend to confuse source memories. What that means is you might have heard something, but you no longer remember where you heard it. In that case, you have source memory confusion such that you can no longer remember where that memory originated from. And it turns out over time, people will begin to be more and more persuaded by low credibility messages that they heard some point in the past because ultimately of that source material or source memory confusion of they forget that it was presented by a low credibility source and over time will begin to just think on the message and come to believe its truth over time. So if you're someone without much credibility and you would like to have people change their opinions, you might want to give it some time after talking to them before asking them about their opinions and or making them act on some new behavior. Now, the what, this is just the nature of the communication. Ultimately, this is the style of communication between those who are speaking and those who are listening. Now, messages that don't seem designed to influence us actually influence us much more than messages that seem like they're designed to influence us. This is probably why we will be more susceptible to Cheerio as ads and not so much to political ads, because when political ads come on, we basically automatically default to presuming it's our or a different political ideology that's presenting the ads. We will pretty much right away be like hesitant because they're designed to change our minds and we become skeptical. Whereas when we see a Cheerios ad, we're just like, oh, those people were super cute and well, maybe Cheerios aren't so bad. Another part of what matters in the style of communication is presenting both sides of a debate if they are available and especially if you can refute the opposing side. If you present an argument in this fashion, it will make people much, much more likely to believe that message. Further, it turns out that speech order actually makes some difference on what messages people will believe. 
So if they're a group of speeches all talking about either different things or different points of view on a single topic, if there are no breaks between those speeches, you want your speech to go first. It will be most persuasive at that time. This is because of something called primacy effect. Uh, we can talk about this more at another time. If they are, however, breaks between the different presentations, it is the last spot that is going to be the most pervasive, and that is the one you want. This has to do with just how people tend to remember lists over time, and the other or converse to that primacy effect is something called the recency effect. It tends to be the most well remembered in that case. Finally, there is the whom. This is to whom the message is going. So a distracted audience will tend to be more readily persuaded by an attentive one. If you're doing something else, if you're not able to pay attention because of either, let's say, young children or chronic pain, you could be distracted by other stimuli like telephones and video games, so on and so forth. These will tend to make people more readily persuaded by messages they receive than when people are actively paying attention. Those with lower intelligence tend to be more influenceable than those with higher intelligence. And it turns out, weirdly enough, that those with moderate self-esteem are actually more influenceable than people with low and high self-esteem. Now, if you think about this for a little while, it actually starts to make sense, but that could just be an example of us explaining a way of finding after the fact in a way to make it seem like it makes sense to us. I'll leave that to you. But people with high self-esteem probably have no trouble in believing what it is they believe and not worrying so much about others who believe, well, whatever they want. And people with low self-esteem oftentimes tend to be stuck in a certain type of rut and are not able to get out of it because they have very specific sets of beliefs about themselves. Those with moderate self-esteem, however, probably fit somewhere in the middle, where they have some degree of confidence or lack thereof in their own opinions, while others tend to be more malleable. Finally, people between the ages of 18 and 25 are the most susceptible to attitude change. Now, this could just be a finding of cohort effects. Well, not quite cohort effects, actually. It could just be that we're conflating this age group with times in our lives. This time in our lives tend to be when we are at college or in some other academic learning institution or we have just left home and are, quote unquote, finding ourselves. Those are all situations highly conducive to attitude change, just because by virtue of us being exposed to so many of them. Now, after that, it's just jobs and nine to five and routine and children and a house and mortgages. And well, you're not really challenged that much or exposed to much outside of your standard life. And it could just be that after that age, we're just not exposed to many situations that result in our attitudes changing. Just something to keep in mind. Another way that people talk about changing attitudes is through something called the elaboration likelihood model. And it explains two ways in which pervasive communication can cause attitude change. The first is this idea of the central route to persuasion. It's the case in which people have both the ability and the motivation to elaborate on pervasive communication, listening carefully to and thinking about the arguments presented. When this route is effective, it generally results in more persistent attitude change. Now, it is important to pay attention to when people have the ability and motivation to elaborate on the message. A lot of times we are lacking in one or the other or even both, not because of in any inherent flaw, but rather just because life takes up a lot of our time and energy. Whenever that is the case, it is hard for us to actually sit and evaluate, or in this case, elaborate on the message that is coming to us and it doesn't really allow us to think much about it. Conversely, if we have the time and motivation, the tendency will be for us to analyze and examine and think quite deeply about whatever this persuasive communication is. And if we find all of those reasons to be sufficient, we will tend to change our attitude and that change will be fairly persistent. There is also the peripheral route to persuasion, and this is the case in which people do not elaborate on the arguments in a pervasive communication and are rather swayed by more superficial cues. 
What we mean here by superficial cues are how attractive the person delivering this communication is. Does it sound like this communication came from a highly credible source? Does it play to certain either ego fantasies that I might have? Or does it result in my moods and feelings being more positive at the end of the day, even though maybe they've not said anything substantial? These would all be ways in which the peripheral route to persuasion can lead us to change our opinions and attitudes about something. So, as I stressed earlier, the key difference is whether individuals have the motivation and ability to pay attention. And, well, if they do, they will be more likely to be persuaded by the central route over the peripheral route, which hopefully should make sense, because if you're paying lots of attention, chances are if someone gives you just a bunch of fluff with a pretty face, you will see through it if you care a lot about this thing and you're paying attention to the pros and cons, so to speak. Now, if you are lacking in that motivation and ability, you cannot focus as much, cannot pay as much attention, cannot weigh the pros and cons, and are likely to be swayed by, like we said earlier, superficial cues. We're going to talk a little bit about evidence for this phenomenon in the next couple slides. So, when it comes to the motivation to pay attention to arguments, here is an example of a study that was conducted in 1981. And here students were told that their university is considering comprehensive exams in order to get a degree. Basically, you would go through your four years at college and then you would be given a set of exams that basically tested you on everything you had learned at college. Now, there were some differences in how they approached these students. The first was personal relevance. For half the students, they were told that this policy is about to be implemented, it's going to be implemented in the near future, and this was the high personal salience condition. This is reflected with this set of the graph right there. Then, for the other half, they were told that this would be implemented in 10 years or so, and so it was not personally relevant. Even for people like me, who spent years and years in their undergraduate degree, this is still probably not that salient because 10 years out, well, I might still be here, but honestly, it's also hard to think about what we'll be doing in 10 years, for many of us at least. Okay, that low personal salience is right here. Now, of those two, they were again divided into two groups. Half of each of them were given a strong argument for why the university was considering this. Half of them were told that the quality of undergraduate teaching would actually get better and has improved at schools with such exams. Now, the other half of each of these groups was given a weak argument for why the university was implementing it. Something like, the risk of failing the exam is a challenge most students would welcome. It's something maybe an admin or a teacher might say, but most students probably are not going to agree with that sentiment. Now, those were further again divided, whereas half of them received that argument, right? Whether strong or weak, but half of both sets received that argument by someone with very high credibility, in this case, a Princeton professor. The other half received an argument delivered by a high school graduate, or in this case, relatively low credibility. And now let's take apart this graph so that we can see what happened. First of all, Please note that the zero line here would result in no change of their attitudes. Going towards the positive is ultimately resulting in a higher degree of agreement towards what is being condoned by the university, in this case, a comprehensive exam, and moving towards the negative, people are likely to resist this idea or disagree with the idea the university has. Okay. So for the group of people who are told this is going to happen right now, or it is very personally relevant, it turns out that the strength of the argument made a huge difference on people's opinions. You see this with the red line. This is the arguments that were presented in a strong fashion. Here you see a high degree of agreement now for this idea of implementing comprehensive exams, while the weak arguments where people said that students will like this challenge those tend to have a fairly high degree of disagreement. And if you look at these two lines, you see that while they do have a slight positive slope, they do not increase very much. That indicates that whether the source had low expertise, a high school student in this case, 
or had high expertise, the Princeton professor did not make much of a difference on people's overall attitudes. This, however, was not the case for the low personally relevant case. So here now, imagine that you're being asked this and you're being told that it will be implemented 10 years from now. So again, you can see that that red line is above the blue line, indicating that we were more swayed by strong arguments than weak arguments, which is nice to know that even in cases that it is not relevant to us, actual factual arguments still make a difference. But here now you can see that the positive slope of both of these lines is greatly higher than it was in that previous slide. This is ultimately indicating that we feel much more favorable towards this statement when it is delivered by a high credibility source, in this case up here. You can see that both of these resulted in agreement regardless of whether it was a strong or weak argument, while when it was delivered by a low expertise source, actually both resulted in disagreement regardless of the argument. Now, just something to keep in mind, but it just shows that if something is put far into the future or we don't feel like it is very relevant, the chances are we will pay much less attention to the actual specifics of the arguments or pervasive communication presented to us. We also have our ability to pay attention to arguments. So as I mentioned previously a couple slides ago, that sometimes even if we want to, it is difficult to pay attention, right? It could be that life is happening, your dog might have a cast or need to go to the vet, children have to go to healthcare, you have assignments looming, there's, well, all kinds of stuff going on in real life right now. And this is made even worse if we're asked to understand material that we don't understand. And I mean, I don't know about many of you, but oftentimes when some ad for a drug company or a new wonder drug comes on and they spend half a minute in ultra fast speak talking about all the interactions and drug complications that could go on, most of that goes right over my head. Not because I'm not trying to listen to it at super fast speed, but just because I don't really understand anything about biochemistry. Now, an example to demonstrate this, they took a group of mock jurors and they showed them a video reenactment of a product liability trial. And now they split up how they told the jurors about this situation. So in one case, they modified the actual testimony of the person in this product liability case. In this case, it was always a molecular biologist. It's just that in one set, this biologist gave an easy to understand and a simple to follow example or what they needed to know about this liability hearing. For the other half, they received this a similar testimony by this biologist, and this time it was just incredibly hard to follow, full of jargon that really only a molecular biolog biologist would understand or know. So half got an example they could understand, half got an example they had no idea what to do with. These were then further subdivided into how they were told about the credentials of this molecular biologist. Half of them were told that this person had published over 45 academic articles. That is a big deal in academia. I mean, at least in psych, I'm probably pretty sure that that's true in most of the other disciplines and has advanced degrees from ranking institutions, stuff like PhD from Princeton and got a postdoc from Columbia or some stuff like that, right? And the other half were told that this person was not that well to do, basically published very few articles over their time and has a degree from a relatively obscure college. Now, when the explanation was easy, the credentials did not matter much at all. Here, whether it was someone who was of high prestige or low prestige, people were able to follow the argument and it was the quality of the argument itself that ultimately led to them changing their opinions or deciding one way or another about guilt or innocence in this trial. When it was difficult to follow, in that case, it was the credibility that mattered much, much more. And if you think about this in personal life, that makes sense. If we can think about a problem for ourselves, we generally don't need to rely on somebody else to tell us what to think. If there is something we just don't understand, but we need it to make some decision in our lives, chances are we will go find someone who knows what they're talking about. 
Think about it like this. If you're not savvy with technology and you need a printer to work, chances are you'll find someone who you know can fix printers and the better a place they learn to fix printers from, the better they are at fixing your printer. Okay, now we will talk about emotion and attitude change. So one of the first of these is this idea of fear arousing communication. This happens a lot. So this is pervasive me persuasive messages that attempt to change people's attitudes by arousing their fears. Now it should not only be fear, eh, there needs to be some kind of actionable information as well, otherwise it just is not going to be effective. It's also the case where if you scare people too much, it's not really going to help them. So here is an example to demonstrate just that. They took three groups of people and this they were all smokers. You can see here if you look closely that all of them were smoking about 70 cigarettes a day, which is a lot of cigarettes. And so they had either two pieces of information available. They were either given a series of instructions on how to quit smoking or shown a very graphic film of all the stuff that can go bad if you keep smoking. Now, if they were given the film to scare them and instructions on how to quit smoking, and in other words, how to relieve that fear, you can see that this blue line shows that they dramatically dropped off in the next two weeks after this film was presented to them and were now only smoking about 25 cigarettes a day. And as this goes out from one month to three months, you can see that that rate of smoking stays pretty low. Now, if you only give people that film where you scare them but don't give them any way to actually change their behavior, you notice there is a dip at first. People do smoke less over the next couple weeks, but over the next few months, you can see that their rate of smoking is beginning to return to where it was originally. Finally, if you just give people instructions on how to quit smoking without arousing any type of fear whatsoever, it actually works in the opposite way. And I'm not sure if this was just that experiment or this is a reliable phenomena, but here you can see if they were just given a set of instructions and told this is how you could quit smoking without anything else, they actually increased the number of cigarettes they smoked over the next month and then slowly came back down to baseline. Basically what to take away from this is that if you are going to use fear arousing messages to change someone's opinions, you have to give them some type of actionable behaviors, I suppose, that will allow them to alleviate that fear. This is something that comes up a lot in people who want to get people to change their opinions around climate change. A lot of times when people are advocating or getting for signs or having people sign petitions, they have a lot of scary stuff like oceans are going to rise, a billion people are going to have to migrate, not enough food and so on and so forth. But oftentimes there's not that much people can do. It seems like a problem that's just too large. And so for a lot of people, they will simply just choose to ignore it because it elicits fear, you know, this end of the world picture that many people are giving. And there's nothing really one can do. And so the best thing one can do in that case is just not think about it because not thinking about it ultimately at the end of the day is better than just being terrified about something that you can't do anything about. Another way in which attitudes and emotions are related is this idea of the heuristic and systematic model of persuasion. And so this just parallels that elaboration likelihood model where there are two paths, one direct and one indirect that ultimately result in our attitudes being changed. And so it ultimately also posits that there are two different ways. When we don't have much time and attitude, we tend, or not attitude, time and motivation, we tend to use heuristics or previously learned behaviors to define our attitudes, while if we have the time and inclination, we are much more likely to use systematic models of persuasion and emotions are less likely now to come into play. So much more emphasis in this gets talked about during the heuristic model because a lot of times that is how we are making our decisions. We're not in fact always paying attention to all the things that contribute to how we make those decisions. So a common heuristic that comes up a lot is when we're trying to go buy something is how does one feel about this? So you ask yourself, right? How do I feel about this? Is this couch great? Is this stereo awesome? Are these pair of sunglasses going to complete me? Something to that effect. 
Now, it works pretty well a lot of the time. We're pretty good at knowing whether we like things or not, but it can be tricked by external forces. So one common thing that happens a lot in real estate agency business is you can bake some really, really delicious cookies in the house before you open it up for an open house. And as people come in to look at that house, they will smell those cookies, probably eat a couple as well. And those cookies tend to have positive emotive feelings in us because many of us tend to associate freshly baked cookies with good feelings. And then we might misconstrue the good feelings arising from the cookies and in turn now think that that is actually arising from the house or the stereo or the glasses or whatever. And that then might result in us overemphasizing how much we like something, how much we evaluated in this way becomes biased by the feelings of some other unrelated fact. Just something to keep in mind. When it comes to emotions and different types of attitudes, persuasion works the best if the persuasive message matches the style of attitude. What we mean by this is if you have cognitively based attitudes, meaning you have attitudes about the particulars of an object, then a central route to persuasion is going to work better. Basically, the central route is again talking in a logical way about the pros and cons and something. And if that's how you built your attitude, it makes sense that that would be the best way to change such attitude. If it is an affectively based attitude based on our feelings and our values, then a peripheral route to persuasion generally works better. Anybody who has tried to have a logical discussion with someone who has a non-logical opinion or attitude probably understands this quite well. No matter how much logic you throw at someone who does not have a logical opinion, it will not change their attitudes whatsoever, really. In fact, they will tend to take it in a negative light because it can be perceived as an attack on their personal values. An example to talk about this. So here, participants were asked to evaluate how favorable they thought a set of products were, and they were exposed to certain types of ads about those products. So the products could be of two different types, a utilitarian product, which in this case is meant to just be defined by some specific attributes of it, meaning think about, for example, a washing machine, something that is high reliability matters a lot, how much it can wash at any given time and can reliably dry 10 towels at a time or something like this, right? Those are all basic parts ultimately of the attributes of this washing machine or this object and whether it is different colors or has an extra four LEDs or can beep in a funny sound probably are going to matter much less. Now, another type of products that were given were social identity products, and these are products whose attractiveness was defined by how we perceive others feel about those products and ultimately us in them. So here, for example, a Metallica t-shirt. I'm probably not wearing a Metallica t-shirt because of the unbelievably high thread count that is in that t-shirt. Much more likely, I am wearing that t-shirt both because of my love for this band and to signal to other people around me that I like that band and that maybe they can talk to me about it if they too like such band. But in this case, talking to me about how well that t-shirt is crafted or what cool qualities of the cotton it has are probably not very likely to change my attitudes on the shirt, especially since I care about Metallica in this case and don't really care that much about the shirt itself. Now, the advertisements that were shown were again of two different kinds. So half the people who received different types of products also received different advertisement types. So half the people who got the utilitarian products saw a cognitively based ad and the other half saw affectively based ads. While of the people who got social identity products, half got cognitively based ads and half got affectively based ads. Let's see what happened. So let's take this graph apart a little bit. Here again, that idea of zero, no attitude change, while any positive number is indicating their attitude change more favorably towards that product, while a negative number is indicating that their attitude changed in a more unfavorable way towards that product. So when it came to products that were utilitarian, like that washing machine, right? Ads that were affectively based, this blue line here, they actually resulted in people liking that product less. 
Whereas when a cognitively based ad was presented, you can see that there was a general increase in how much they favored that item. And this pattern is reversed for affectively based items, which fits with this original idea of matching like to like. Here, affectively based products had a general decrease in their attractiveness when a cognitively based ad was used, while there was an increase in how favorably those items were reported when an affectively based ad was used. If you are going to go into advertising, it's something to keep in mind. Okay, let's talk about attitude change in the body. So the state of the environment and the position, posture, and actions of the body can have an impact on how our attitudes change. An example of this comes from an experiment in which participants were asked to test the durability of some headphones. While they used the headphones, they listened to some arguments on whether students should be made to carry ID cards. Finally, they were asked for their agreement on that message itself. Now, some conditions. Half the participants were either told to nod their heads and keep nodding their heads the entire time they listened, and the other half were told to shake their heads and just keep shaking their heads the entire time they listened. Further, they also varied the argument strength such that half of each of those earlier groups received strong arguments, things, for example, like ID cards would make the campus a safer place, and half of each of those earlier groups received weak arguments, something to the effect of, if students carried those cards, then security cards would have more time for lunch. Now, let's see what happened. Here, you can see the first two bars represent what happened when strong arguments were presented through the headphones. People who nodded their head tend to have a higher degree of agreement or a more favorable attitude change towards the idea of being made to carry ID cards, while those who shook their heads tended not to have such a degree of agreement. Now, conversely, you can see that when, oops, sorry, I forgot to turn on the little laser pointer again. So that was right here. You can see that in this blue bar here, people, when they were nodding their head, had a greater degree of favorable attitude change than did people who were shaking their head. You see the opposite pattern for when weak arguments were presented. Here, when people are nodding their heads, they actually have much less positive attitude change than when people were shaking their head. Now, what's going on here? The idea here is that when you're sh or nodding your head, you're much more confident in your own opinions, being able to judge the argument as strong here and being able to judge the argument as weak here, and this is reflected in our attitude change. When we are shaking our head, generally this is associated with disagreement or confusion, and in both of those cases, we are about equally likely to be swayed by a message. Now, there could be some other ways to explain this if you really wanted, and there is quite a bit of literature actually showing all the different kinds of ways our body being influenced can change how we define or set our own opinions. It can even be things as wild as how heavy a clipboard is that is given to us while we're filling out some survey. And now, advertising. When it comes to advertising, most people tend to think that it works on everyone but themselves. This is yet another place where the fundamental attribution error rears its head. It's the same idea as most of us tend to think that we're above average drivers. Now, much of this thinking centers around this idea of no harm can come from watching a bunch of commercials because after all, some of them are pretty fun and they don't influence me anyhow. That is not necessarily the case. One example of this comes from this idea of split cable marketing. And the way this works, probably before things like Netflix were huge, even though there are probably more modern ways in which this can be conducted. Here, a whole group of people who are receiving network subscriptions are given a set of cards to use while they go shopping. And half those people are presented with certain types of ads while others are not. And then their spending habits are tracked via these cards that they're using. Excuse me. And it's been reliably shown that those households to whom the ads were presented will buy those products at a higher rate than to whom they were not. Now, 
This raises the idea about customized ad experience. This is just one of those things that you'll have to think about for yourself. But the idea here is that just playing ads, it seems to be enough to get people to buy more product, which we see with this idea of split cable marketing. But remember when we were talking about attitudes change or attitude change needing to be personally relevant to us before we start to actually think about it and when it matters more? What actually are we doing when we personalize our ad experiences? We are ultimately telling those who are giving us ads what things matter the most to us. And by doing so, we are telling them what ads are most likely to be effective towards us, not only just for the products we defined as interesting, but for different types of ads for those we do not find interesting, but people still would like us to buy. Again, something to keep in mind. So how advertising works. Most advertisements take an emotional route and they do so by stressing how their product is related to either excitement, youth, energy, sexual attractiveness, etc. And it works great for mostly affectively based attitudes. Things where we have not spent a lot of time thinking about the actual factual or physical properties about something and the actual pros and cons of it those are the cases in which this will generally work pretty well. It is unlikely that you have spent a lot of time thinking about the pros and cons of the nutritional benefits of Coca-Cola, and rather you spend your time thinking about how a nice cold can of Coca-Cola that has that wonderful crisp sound is just so deliciously bubbly. In cases like that, that is ultimately a product towards which we have an affectively based attitude and advertisement that stresses some kind of emotional route is actually going to work pretty well towards changing our attitudes. When dealing with products that have cognitively based attitudes, so how I feel about, let's say, power drills, for example, personal relevance matters a lot. If I'm actually interested in buying a new power drill, then something that's just straightforward, logical, and fact-based, telling me about the RPMs, how much horsepower it has, and what drill bits can fit in it, is going to be a really good way to get a person to change their attitudes towards some type of product. Now, it's not always going to be the case, right? You probably, well, maybe, I don't know you, but maybe you care about power drills and maybe you don't. And well, if you don't, then maybe that ad would fall perfectly flat. Or you could just make it relevant. And now while you might be thinking to yourself, how would a power drill ever be relevant to my life? Well, we could sit and brainstorm it, but let me show you some examples of how people have made things relevant that are totally disconnected from the ad itself. So this is actually probably one of the more famous ads in advertising history. You probably wouldn't see it anymore today just because it is horribly sexist, but it ran for, I think, several decades, actually. And so it's put on top. You can't really read this here and you could try and piece it out in your book. But basically what they're saying here is often a bridesmaid and never a bride. And I wish I could be there in person so I could just stare at you and ask you what you thought this ad was actually for. And well, maybe you would say all kinds of bridal related things or some such. And I would be pretty amazed if you would guess that this is in fact an ad for Listerine. Yep, Listerine. So it turns out that Listerine was acquired by this person and they had originally had it as in, well, not a cure, but a disinfectant for mouth illnesses. And there wasn't that much market for that at the time. And so they were like, okay, well, let's create something of why people should use this. And they talked about halitosis as bad breath. And ultimately they related bad breath to not becoming a bride and therefore Listerine would help with that. Wait a second, you just made up a disease so you could tie it to people's insecurities and then market a product that was originally designed to do something else to fulfill that fake need because it's now tied to our insecurities? Holy shit. And while you might be thinking to yourself, oh, hopefully that's a thing of the past, well, when was the last time you sprayed yourself with Axe Bio Spray and either had a whole posse of semi-naked people stick and glom onto you, or have you
I've been paying attention to the ingredients all this time. Hmm. So, couldn't talk about advertising without talking a little bit about subliminal advertising, and a lot of times this gets talked about as a form of mind control. So, subliminal messages are just words, pictures, or sounds that are not consciously perceived, but may nonetheless influence our judgments, attitudes, and behaviors. And just an example of a real life situation where this happened. So down here, you can see this rats. This was actually flashed for a 30th of a second in an ad from George W. Bush, I believe it was, who was running against Al Gore at the time. And this was an ad disparaging Al Gore. And basically, as they were talking about one of their propositions or campaigns or some such, they mentioned how the bureaucrats something something and as the person was saying bureaucrats they flashed rats on the screen for a 30th of a second it was noticed by a person who passed it on and it became a big thing but do such messages work well there is pretty much no scientific evidence whatsoever that these types of subliminal messages encountered in everyday life have any influence on our behavior. It's important to keep track of that everyday life, right? So a lot of products get sold marketing this idea of subliminal messaging, right? Tracks of music that's supposed to have things that will increase our self-esteem or improve our memory or help us quit smoking. And controlled studies looking at these have found zero differences between people listening to messages with subliminal messages embedded in them and controls who did not receive those messages. So chances are, it does not work. There has, however, been some evidence to show that there is an effect of subliminal messages in laboratory settings. So this is the counter to in everyday life earlier. And here you can see that if you flash certain messages to participants in a laboratory setting, you can bias their behavior a little bit. Now, it's important to remember that ultimately this falls under the branch of research called priming. Much robust literature is there for priming, but this tends to only take place in situations carefully curated, right? In a laboratory setting, full degree of attention is devoted to some particular thing in which you will get the subliminal message. There are almost no other distractions, and it oftentimes is a contrived task that is being biased by the subliminal message. Right, so even in cases that are purely abstracted or laboratory-like, there is no evidence to show that subliminal messages can get people to act counter to their wishes, values, or personalities. Finally, it is quite unfortunate that while interest maintains in subliminal messages, it often obscures the fact that superliminal messages or those messages that we are consciously perceiving, right, just straightforward regular ads, work much, much better than subliminal advertising. We tend, of course, to be much more worried about subliminal forms of advertising than actual explicit ones, even though those are the ones that are much more harmful. But humans are full of those kind of inconsistencies, just exactly like how many of us are afraid of flying but not driving, even though statistically much safer to fly. Okay, so now let's talk about advertising stereotypes and culture. Before I tell you a little story about that, um, a little bit about ads as they are. So it is relatively recent that non-standard people have been shown in ads. By that, I just mean people who are cis hetero European American from nuclear families. Nuclear families just means there's a mother, a father, and some children, and that's all. Um, also, you could add people who are disabled to this list. Now, please, please note, no such thing as an actual standard human being, right? At least not by these dimensions. You could say humans are standard on other metrics, like they have hearts or something like that, but these are not things that make people standard. Anyway, in 2013, there was an ad with a multiracial couple and their biracial daughter, and it got a ton of hate. It got a bunch of positive support too, but a ton of hate. Um, in case you're wondering, this was a Cheerios commercial where the little girl asks the mom if Cheerios are in fact good for the heart, and then she goes and pours a bunch on top of her sleeping father's heart. It is adorable. Okay, now think about what's happening for a second. 
let's just say that half the people hated this ad and half the people loved this ad. So you have a bunch of people who are just super mad that you would ever show something that doesn't fit with their ideology and the other half is like, woohoo, it's about time. Now, what happens when the bottom line of a multi-million dollar industry is threatened, right? If all of a sudden half the people who got mad about this were like, no more Cheerios, it's time to boycott Cheerios, even though Honey Nut Cheerios are delicious, no more Cheerios. How likely is it, do you think, that a company in charge of such a huge product is likely to keep presenting ads that are willfully setting off a full half of their potential buyers? Chances are they're not going to stick to their guns and actually keep presenting ads that are more representative of the actual population and will default to something that people don't make a big deal about. Thankfully, in this case, that's not true because a year later, this ad got shown at the Super Bowl. <laughs> Gender in advertising, well, big problems here, I suppose. So lots of studies have examined gender roles in ads and found that women are just much more likely to be portrayed as subservient than men. There is a slight trend that this is changing, but it is still pretty skewed. Now, if you're constantly being exposed to this, chances are one tends to absorb those attitudes implicitly, ultimately, right? Remember, we talked about implicit attitudes earlier, and those tend to reflect the biases of our society. We will tend to incorporate those even if we're not actively thinking about or endorsing such behaviors. Thus, many, many young children who continue to see such advertisements are likely to internalize these types of gender norms. Other studies have also found a strong link between advertising and unrealistic body images. Um, it's been shown that if you ask people to look at media portrayals of unrealistic bodies, I just mean people who are overly skinny or have been photoshopped to have no pimples whatsoever or zero body hair and chiseled abs and stuff like that, it tends to result in a dip in our own body self image. And this is true for women and men. Finally, a little bit about culture and advertising. So while advertising does work pretty much across cultures, it tends to require a different method of communication in different types of cultures. In cultures that are highly individualistic, advertisements that stress individualism, personal achievement, personal growth tend to work fairly well, but they work pretty marginally in collectivist cultures. Their advertising advertisements stressing the group's health collective advancement, overall well-being, and family values tend to work much more than those types of ads work in individualistic cultures. Okay, finally, a little bit about resisting these pervasive messages, which is great because I feel like I have spent a whole bunch of time telling you all the ways in which people can change what you think and feel. So some methods of resisting. One of the first is just to be alert to product placement. Just be aware. And it is very common to think that that is just so silly and how could it ever work? But here is something to put in your head. It is reported that Heineken paid $45 million. I'm gonna say that again, $45 million to get James Bond to drink a beer instead of a martini. First of all, how could they let James Bond drink a beer instead of a martini? Well, I guess for $45 million. Now, you can argue that way one way or another, but would a company as big as Heineken that has had ads for years upon years upon years shell out $45 million? I could pay rent forever. I could buy houses and have rent paid to me with that amount of money for what this person drank a beer over. If they're shelling out that kind of cash, chances are they're getting some benefit from it, right? Be aware of product placement. Children are especially susceptible to this, and adults actually are too when we're given lots and lots of options, right? You've seen a lot of Tide all over the place, and you stand in that laundry detergent aisle, and there are 1,800 million different types of detergents all promising the earth and the moon and the sun. Probably default to ones you've seen a lot. Forewarning works well to guard against this form of attitude change, right? So I've told you a little bit about being aware of it. Don't forget that you should be aware of it. And if you're around young children, tell them to be aware of it also.
There is attitude inoculation. This idea is very similar to receiving regular inoculations. And this is you give people small samples of arguments against their position, and it allows them ultimately to think about ways in which they can support their own view and how they would argue against other positions. If they're all of a sudden confronted with a very logical or very good or very persuasive argument against their position, if they have never thought about ways to defend from different types of critiques, chances are they will easily get overwhelmed and change their attitude. If they have spent a long time thinking about different ways in which you could agree or disagree with their point of view or their attitude, and they have then also thought about ways to agree or disagree with those claims or refutations, chances are when presented with some argument against their position, they will be ready for it or they're inoculated against it. This works very well against having your attitude changed. Finally, resisting peer pressure. So peer pressure works primarily through the fear of rejection and luckily we get somewhat less susceptible to this as we get older, but there's no hard and fast rule there. Now an inoculation type thing works to some degree in basically practicing what a person would do to resist this peer pressure is a pretty good way to go about helping someone resist, even though this is probably always going to result in a fair degree of pressure because we are social beings and to be excluded from a group is pretty high up on our list of terrors. So an example here would be that you have a young child or sibling who might conceivably come across other people who will smoke cigarettes and will want them to have a cigarette and might say something like, come on, just one drag, what kind of chicken are you? And if you've practiced this with them, they will be more likely to say back something like, I'd be more chicken if I smoked just to impress you. Now, you could say that right away if you've practiced it a bunch, right? Remember, spontaneous behaviors will be the most likely predicted by behaviors that have been highly trained. If they have never thought about what they're gonna say in this kind of situation, chances are they'll be overwhelmed, want to look cool, try and hide their insecurity and have a drag of that smoke, right? Versus if they've practiced it a bunch, they're like, ooh, I know what's coming, ha ha, I have a good witty comeback already and loaded. Chances are not going to feel insecure in this situation, not going to need to impress them as much. And well, maybe you might save someone from starting to smoke. Finally, when persuasion attempts backfire. So this is talked about by something called reactance theory. And that is the idea that when people feel their freedom to perform a certain behavior is threatened, an unpleasant state or resistance is aroused which can be reduced by performing the prohibited behavior. An easy way to think about this of yourself would be if I say, don't look at that gross thing, chances are the first thing you're going to do is go look at it. Now, that is an example of just curiosity. Here, it is much more associated with commands and authority. So here, for example, if you were to have a bathroom where the management had written do not write on these walls versus please don't write on these walls and maybe some story about why not to. In one case, they seem much more human and we're not feeling like we're receiving a command and therefore less likely to do the behavior. Whereas when we're told don't write on the wall, we feel like we're being given a command and we don't like our autonomy and will to be threatened and therefore might actually write on the wall to regain that power over ourselves as false and fleeting as such powers are. And that's it for now.